to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Isaiah chapter 1, verse number 18. We welcome you today to our study of the book of Isaiah. In this series of Old Testament prophets, we're thinking about some, some powerful lessons that God gave to the people of Israel that apply practically to God's people today as well. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. Uh, we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ in your area. would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday for Bible study, you would be an honored guest at any of their Bible studies. And so we encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your area. If you'd like to have a Bible study, learn more about the scriptures, the plan of salvation, the church that Jesus built, you'll find people there who love God, who are concerned about souls, and who simply want to help men and women know God's word better. And so we invite you to visit the local congregation in your area. Also, in your journey to know God's Word better, we'd love to help you as well here at the Gospel of Christ. And so check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our material. We have a wide variety of good Bible study materials, audio lessons, video lessons, transcripts, all of those things are available from our website at your disposal free of charge. And if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson on the prophets, friend, won't you stop by our website, fill out a media request form. We'd be glad to send that to you in the mail free of charge if you need a DVD or CD, or you can receive it instantaneously by selecting a digital download. And don't forget about the Gospel of Christ app. It's available in the respective uh, Play Stores. You can get it there from the App Store and the Play Store. Free, great tool that you can study God's Word in our fast-paced world today. As we think about the prophet Isaiah, what a great man of God Isaiah was and, and preaching during such a difficult time in the kings of Israel. The backdrop of Isaiah is he preaches a message to the nations, to Assyria and others that they need to get right with God. And of course, that message mainly is to Israel, how they need to get their life right with God in every way. Let me, let me tell you just a little bit about the prophet Isaiah himself. The name Isaiah means salvation. This is a message of God saving Israel and in reality, anyone who will submit to his will and to his way. Isaiah began prophesying in about somewhere around the year 750, 759 B.C. in the last year of the reign of Uzziah, king of Israel. And so we've got a message coming 750 years before Christ and Christianity comes on the scene. Now, another unique thing about Isaiah is that Isaiah's message that his wife, Isaiah's wife was a prophetess of Israel. She, he was a prophet and she also did some prophesying in Israel as well. Uh, Jewish history will actually record for us that Isaiah was placed in a log, and he was actually sawn in two. And we see some pictures of that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 37. And so that's a little bit about the history of Isaiah himself. Let me break down some things that might help to understand the book a little better. There's a key word that occurs in the book, and that is the word salvation. As we mentioned, that's Isaiah's name, and you will hear the word salvation throughout the book of Isaiah. It occurs 25 times 
and only seven times in all the other prophetic books. And so this idea of salvation, God providing a means, a way, and a method of salvation is much of what the book of Isaiah is all about. I would say the key verse is Isaiah 53, verse 6. He has laid on him, that suffering servant, in Isaiah 53, he has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Somebody is going to bear our sins and somebody is going to deal with the sin problem and that someone, of course, ultimately is the coming Savior. There's a key phrase that you'll also find in the book and that key phrase is, Holy One. 33 times we will hear about the Holy One, representative of, of God or God's angelic ones who are coming in judgment as well at times. They're predicted, seen as such a vibrant picture of holiness, which is the very nature of our God. Key chapter, of course, begins in Isaiah. It's what we know of as Isaiah 53, but it actually begins in Isaiah 52, verse 13, and runs all the way through Isaiah 53, verse number 10. And so you've got this key chapter depicting the suffering servant. One of the things that is really unique about Isaiah is in many ways, Isaiah is kind of like a, a miniature Bible. Take all the books of the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, all 66 books. And what's interesting about that is in the book of Isaiah, chapters 1 through 39 are a lot like the 39 books of the Old Testament. We, we see glimpses of God's promise. We see pictures uh, of the Messiah, but they represent mainly, chapters 1 through 39 mainly represent God's judgment on the nations and his people if they don't follow his will. Then you've got that breakdown where it's like the New Testament. Chapters 40 through chapter 66 are a lot like the 27 books of the New Testament. It, there's a message uh, uh, of hope. There is a remnant. There is salvation that is coming from uh, Jerusalem. And, that, and that's picturesque of everything that Jesus did and what happened in the New Testament era as well. Now, let's take just a few moments. And I want you, if you haven't got your Bible, I want you to make sure and get that. We want to look at some practical messages from the book of Isaiah that apply so readily to our hearts and our lives today. Take your Bible and look in Isaiah chapter 1, verse number 18 with me. God says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. For man to get right with God, for man to be what God wants him to be, he's got to reason together. He's got to come to God and reason, think through, and put to practice what God tells him to do. You see, my friend, if I'm going to be saved, just like in the days of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, I've got to be saved the way God tells me. I've got to reason with God through the divine scriptures. That's the only way I can be saved. And, and the fact that I have this reasoning ability, I'm created by a logical God. And that reasoning ability has been put into us to understand truth. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Paul said to the church in Thessalonica, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. You can know truth, John 8 verse 32. You can know error, Jude verse 3. And you can be confident that you know the truth and are right with God when we follow the Bible. I reason together with God when I submit my heart and my life to His divine word. Acts 17, 11. The Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. When we come to God's word with a good and honest heart 
and, and we decide I'm going to do what God says and let his will reign over my life, then friend, we're reasoning correctly the way God wants us to reason. Then I want you to learn a powerful lesson or see a powerful lesson from Isaiah chapter 2. And this deals with the coming kingdom of God and the house of the Lord that is prophesied about. Look in Isaiah chapter 2, and I want you to notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse number 1. The scripture says, The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains it shall and shall be exalted above the hills. All nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, nor shall they learn war anymore. When I hear about this passage where we have the house of the Lord coming and that house is going to be established on top of the hills and on top of the mountains and, and all nations are going to flow to it. What is that house of the Lord? You see, my friend, during the time of Isaiah, the temple would have been representative of that. But all nations flowing to it? That, that's not the picture we see. It was for Israel and the Jewish nation. This is a prophecy of the coming kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Isaiah chapter 2, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be built and established on top of Zion or in Jerusalem. That's a picture of how the Lord's church was going to be built in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. You see, the church is referred to as the house of God. Paul said, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. 1 Timothy 3, verses 15 and 16. The house of God in the New Testament is the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here we have a prophecy that that house is going to be built in Jerusalem, going to come forth from Zion and Jerusalem. Well, did that happen in the Bible? Absolutely. In Acts chapter 2, as Peter stands up with the eleven for the very first time, they proclaim salvation in Jesus Christ. People cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And the clarion answer is repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And those who gladly received his word were baptized. And Acts 2.47 tells us, in Jerusalem, for the first time, the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. The church was set up in Jerusalem at the preaching of the gospel where the law came forth just as the prophet Isaiah promised that it would. Then as you think about practical lessons from the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 5, we kind of learn that God's people then and some of the nations then had a backward morality, not unlike some people have today. Notice Isaiah chapter 5 with me. I want you to look in your Bible in verse number 20. Isaiah says, Woe to those who call good evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Here, here you've got a picture of people who have things really backwards in their mind. They're calling good evil. They're calling sweet bitter. They're calling light darkness. They are so messed up in their thinking morally that the good is bad and the bad is good. Friend, I wonder today if we don't have a lot of the same problems we have come, in some ways, people have come so far away from God that we don't really understand what sin is. Sin is a separation from God. 
it breaks the heart of God and it is breaking of the law of God. Things like adultery, fornication, homosexuality, whether a man's a man and a woman's a woman or not. Friend, God clearly defines that in the Bible and yet our morality is so backward that we just don't seem to understand. We've taken the good and made it bad and we've taken the bad and made it good. How do you resolve that problem? God says, come to me and let me tell you what good is and what bad is. Friend, if we'll simply let God's voice be the only voice we listen to on morality, if we'll let God tell us what's right, what's a man and what's a woman and what marriage is and, and how people ought to live and things of that nature, all the confusion eliminated. All the confusion, if we let God's word be the standard of morality, all the confusion on the matter disappears. But sadly, sometimes like the people then, we have things backwards as to the way it ought to be. Then there's a passage in the book of Isaiah that is often misused and misapplied to someone that Isaiah never intended for it to. Look at Isaiah chapter 14 with me. Many times when people talk about the devil, they'll run to Isaiah 14, but in context, Isaiah 14 is not talking about the devil. Look at Isaiah 14, verse number 3. God says, it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord, in the day the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow and from your fear and the hard bondage in which you are made to serve, that you will take up this proverb against the king of, now watch this, against the king of Babylon and say, and in this whole context, running verses uh, three all the way at least through the end of the chapter is a woe or a, a proverb against the king. Listen now, it's against the king of Babylon. Now the problem is people forget the context and we jump down to verse number 13 and we hear God say, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you have weakened the nations. And, and we, take this, we take this passage, which Isaiah doesn't tell us, God doesn't tell us, you have to read something into the passage not there, and we think, Lucifer, falling from the sky, all this graphic image must be talking about Satan. And yet, God's already told me specifically and exactly who it's talking about. Take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. Is there some dramatic language? Absolutely. Is he pictured as falling from a, a high and lofty place? Sure. But he held that power. He had that authority. He was sitting in the chair of the king at that time. And so he, he falls from that picturesque place. But, but to, to, to read, no other Bible verse tells us this. No other writer. We're told specifically what it is. I have to put something into the text here that the Bible doesn't tell me. And so to get the idea that this is talking about Satan, you simply don't find that in Isaiah or anywhere else in the Bible. Now, one of the things that Isaiah specifically tells us was a problem for the people of his day is that they wanted to hear smooth words. Look in your Bible in Isaiah chapter 30 with me, and I want you to notice what God here says about the people. Isaiah chapter 30, the Bible says in verse number 10, here's what the people wanted, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things, listen to this now, speak to us smooth, smooth things, prophesy deceits. Can you imagine that? God's people came to Isaiah and they said, don't tell us the truth. Don't tell us what's right. Don't give us all that smooth stuff. We want you to get up and preach a lie to us and we're going to believe it. Can you imagine anybody having that mindset? And yet, friends, so many people today are so quick to believe a lie. Somebody stands up dressed in the right outfit, in the right atmosphere, with a certain amount of authority put on them. And people just believe it, just like that. You see, Paul encouraged Timothy 
to preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering long doctrine. Why? For the time will come. This is a lot like Isaiah 30, verse 10. Time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they'll heap up for themselves teachers who will prophesy basically and preach false things to them. You see, friend, the truth is what matters. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. God's word is what saves. James 1.21, Romans 1.16, and my heart needs to be like that of, of, of Samuel, who when God cried out to him, Samuel said, speak, Lord, your servant hears. 1 Samuel chapters 2 and 3. Then in the book of Isaiah, we come across one of the more picturesque and, and beautiful passages that describes the joy of serving God. Would you look in your Bible in Isaiah chapter 40 with me? This is such a beautiful passage. You see it a lot of times in, in the decorations and things like that, picture frames, things like that. Look at Isaiah 40, verse number 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. That's such a beautiful picture. Those who are waiting on the Lord. That describes a person who is not running ahead of God, who's not forcing the situation, who in patience, although he may not understand how everything's going to work out, he doesn't know how, he knows who. Those who wait on the Lord in God's time in God's way, according to his purpose. If I can set my heart to let God worry about all the big stuff and I'll just do what I'm supposed to do, those who wait on the Lord, what's that going to be like? It's like mounting up with wings of, a, wings of an eagle. It's like the one who can run and he never gets tired. The one who is, is always active and he never gets faint. Look at those pictures mounting up with wings of an eagle. You look up in the sky, watch the eagle soar. Just a, a, amazing in and of itself. Friend, that's the picture of those who wait on God. God's going to take care of those who put their trust in Him. God's going to help them in every way. We simply need to strive to do what God tells us to do. And friend, that leads us right into the next practical lesson. Let's talk about for just a moment Isaiah's purpose that he mentions for our life. Isaiah reminds us what the whole purpose of life is. Take your Bible and look with me in Isaiah chapter 43, verse number 7. Isaiah chapter 43, I want you to look in verse number 7. God says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. What's life all about? Why am I here? What's my purpose? Listen to what God says. Everyone who's called by my name, whom I've created, watch this now, for my glory. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Why am I here? What's my purpose in life? Why God put me on? I am here to glorify God. I am here to live a life that honors God in every way. Paul said something similar in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether we eat or whether we drink or whatever we do, we do all to the glory of God. And so my friend, my life and yours is to be lived in such a way that it brings God the glory and honor that he deserves. I am to seek first God's kingdom. Matthew 6, Solomon thought about the purpose of life, and he said, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's it all about? Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. And friend, as you think about the Messiah in the book of Isaiah, that ties in so beautifully with this picture. 
The Messiah was born of a virgin. He had the power over the nations. Isaiah 7, 14, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. He was of that royal lineage. And of course, according to the Bible, he was that suffering servant of God. Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, verse 4, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. And friend, no doubt Peter thought about that in 1 Peter 2, 24, when he said these words, he himself bore our sins in his own body upon the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. It's the blood of Jesus that makes us right with Almighty God. There's, like in the message of Isaiah, we got to come and reason with God. Friend, God tells me what to do to be saved. God tells me I must recognize His way is the only way. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. I must accept Jesus as that way and believe in him. John chapter 8, verse 24. I must be willing to turn from a life of sin in repentance and turn to God. Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. I must make that good confession, just like the Ethiopian eunuch. I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then to contact his death. I must be buried with him in baptism into his death. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And so we're so glad you joined us for our study of the book of Isaiah. We encourage you to join us next time as we're going to study more of these powerful and prophetic books from the Word of God. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.